A young person recently told me that while he had no epileptic seizure for over a year, he still takes the medication every morning out of fear that he will have a seizure. Imagine your loved one taking this medication every morning just out of fear and not out of necessity. About 1%, one every 100 people, suffers from epilepsy. But the problem is actually bigger because about 10 people out of 100 suffer from migraine. And the consequences and the abnormalities in the brain of migraine are very similar to the early onset of an epileptic seizure. How can we improve on that? We are dealing with a poor disease management. Is that familiar? Well, diabetes was a poorly, diseased, uh, managed, poorly managed disease for a long time. But advances in technology actually enable us today to continuously monitor the glucose level in the blood and from that release insulin at the right time and at the right amount, making this disease completely managed. What if we could do the same with our brain? In order to be able to do that, we need a powerful, wearable brain monitor and then the feedback that is here. Well, these are powerful brain monitors that are being used nowadays. They are clearly not portable. This is still being used nowadays, still not really wearable. <laughs> In order to understand what it is that we can do, let's look a little bit about EEG, which uh, this sensor is doing. What we really want is something like this, something like this band, which I'll put on my head a little later with very few electrodes and monitor our brain. Can we do that? What does it require? Let's look at EEG. The most seminal work in EEG was actually done 90 years ago, in 1926. Can you imagine how much progressed, how much science progressed in those 90 years? Technology, science, medicine. However, still in 2015, people use the same language, the same signal processing language that Hans Berger started 90 years ago. This is what we hope to change. Let's look at an analogous situation. Here's an orchestra, a lot of musical instruments, but note that next to every musical instrument, there is a microphone. Do we really need all these microphones? Absolutely not. In fact, we can listen to the whole orchestra with a single ear and decompose in our brain the music completely, distinguishing between the different musical instruments based on sound production, based on the shape of the instrument. So we can distinguish between a viola, a cello, and a violin just based on the shape of the instrument. What we are very good at doing is analyzing what's called the color or the timbre of the sound, and that helps us decompose these things. But what does that have to do with the brain? Let's see. This is a neuron. We have a lot of such neurons in our brain. When a neuron is active, it is releasing a little bit of current, changing its voltage, called action potential. When a large ensemble of neurons are active, they actually release a big wave, a big electrical wave. When many ensembles are active, they are producing an orchestra of brain activity. How can we distinguish the different uh, specific functional neural networks from this orchestra. So the first thing to note is that the different functional neural networks differ in many characteristics, in the location in cortex, in the size of the network, in the number of the neurons, in the type of neurons, in the type of synapses. All these are creating characteristics like the timbre, the sound of music. A signal processing task to do this distinction, both in music or in the brain, has not yet been developed. This is a very difficult task. But this is exactly what we are trying to do. So we have developed a mathematical mechanism to separate those sounds from one another and to enable uh, those uh, different functional neural networks to work on its own or to be separated. We do that in continuous 
computation on the cloud because it's intensively difficult, and uh, we can return a high-level brain interpretation to every application that wants to use it. And this is how it's supposed to look. If that all works and communication works, uh, this dragon will start flipping its wings based on the amount of concentration that I have right now. Let's see where can we take this. We want to take it into brain enhancement, not just brain disease management. Why do we need brain enhancement? Well, okay, before I talk about brain enhancement, let me just describe uh, the representation that we obtain with uh, this functional network. So what we see here is an analogous to the orchestra that I was talking about before. So different line in this representation represents a difficult musical instrument in our brain, namely a diff different functional neural network. The color changes from blue to red, which describes the intensity of that functional neural network. And the x-axis describes time. So what we see here is an example of a person that is being asked to say no five times to five questions. In one of them, he's going to lie. If we look carefully, we see that at the third answer to the question, there's a little bit of activity at the bottom part. This represents stress. This represents stress of lying to that question. We can also see that the first two questions produced very strong activity of many functional neural networks, kind of in anticipation of potentially lying in the answer. And after lying, the last two answers produced very little information, very little activity, because the question was already trivial. How can we take that into brain enhancement? And why do we need brain enhancement? So one reason is the current situation, where one out of six kids suffers from some kind of developmental disorder. So instead of just taking our computation, signal processing, and powerful artificial intelligence and try to replace the brain, why not try to enhance the brain with those tools? How can we do that? A simple way turns out to be video games. It turns out that sophisticated video games which rely on brain monitoring, which enable us to really see what's going on in the brain at the same time, can actually enhance brain activity. So let's look at some examples of what I'm talking about. And first, let's look at just monitoring for uh, the sake of e-learning. Part of our teachers are being replaced by computers nowadays. A teacher can tell right away when a student is concentrated or not, the computer does not know that. In this project, uh, with, which is done with Matach in Tel Aviv, we are actually monitoring the concentration level of students while they are studying. This one is an amazing story. This woman is actually moving that ball just with her thoughts, but not with the motor cortex, which is here, but with the frontal cortex, which, which produces decisions, emotions, and cognitive activities. So she can move the ball just with that. Imagine what this can do for brain training, what this can do uh, as a feedback for those people who cannot speak and demonstrate what is going on in their brain. We talked about games, we talked about video games, and we actually developed a concept around video games to enhance activity. <laughs> which we can see here. <laughs> so this woman is saying in Hebrew that uh, she got very excited. What this computer game is doing is allowing us to control our car race, uh, our car with our fingers, but to control the speed of our car or the opponent's car with a certain thought in our brain. So if I want to improve my mood, I would have to increase my speed of my car by improving my mood. And this is the kind of feedback that we can talk about. In lifestyle, we can talk about emotional chat. So here, 
This was a project that was developed in the hackathon in Tel Aviv. Uh, a group of uh, neuroscientists actually developed this and added emoticons to the chat indicating the response, the emotional response of the listener in the chat. But maybe the most important thing is again music. While we can monitor people as they play music, we can do just, we can do much more. What we see here is Matan playing a guitar and adding music coming from his brain activity to the guitar. As you know, to learn a violin takes a very long time. However, if we use a technique like this, we can actually train our brain with music produced by the brain, which is the ultimate mirror indicating to us what is happening in our brain. It is my hope that with this technology, it would be possible to improve brain disease management and brain enhancement and make it as fun and pleasant as a computer game. Thank you. Thank you.